All right, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Um, I do appreciate uh, everyone joining us for our webinar today. And it is, um, we have Dr. Tracy English with us, with uh, Executive Director with Long Life Care Management. And she's gonna be talking about caring for the caregiver uh, during this time, during our COVID-19 crisis. Um, so I think this will be a very good topic. I know one I'm interested in, I have a, um, an elderly father, he's 83 with some health issues that uh, we've been working with him and uh, during this time. So I'm really looking forward to um, what Dr. English has to say. I do wanna let everyone know we have our other webinars that we've done previously. Uh, they are on our resource page. If you haven't looked at it, it's www.together, the number four, Henry, Dot com and in the chat I've actually put the link there uh, to that resource page so if you get an opportunity to check that out uh, this one will also be recorded and will uh, be on that resource page in a couple of days um, so if you know anybody that didn't get a chance to join us or you want to take a look at it later um, feel free to reach out there um, so Dr. English has a presentation for us when that's over we will have an opportunity for any questions, you can use the chat feature or there's a Q&A feature also. You can use either one of those to uh, ask any questions. You can type them in anytime during the presentation and then I'll go over the questions uh, at the end that we have. Uh, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. English. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Gary. I'm glad to be here. I am um, a fairly new member of the chamber, but I'm glad to be here and support and share um, and really serve the members and their guests. Um, and like Gary, I think that this topic is um, just really crucial right now, the opportunity to not only take care of one another, but also to be sensitive to a population that's been pretty busy serving for quite some time, and that's caregivers, family caregivers in particular. So we'll get to the topic, maybe take about 30 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity to share, answer questions, and hopefully you'll gain a number of resources or at least feel supported um, and perhaps be enlightened of caregivers that are in your community. Okay. So I'll share my screen here. So I want to start with um, just caregiving, caring for the caregivers. Um, I think this caption really says a lot. Many times caregivers feel very much isolated or alone, maybe not physically, but in their concerns emotionally and worries about their loved ones. So I hope that we'll have the opportunity to um, kind of uh, share a bit and give you some resources as you care for um, a loved one or as you care for a caregiver, caring for a loved one. Um, I, as um, Gary mentioned, I'm uh, Dr. Tracy English. I'm a nurse practitioner and executive director of Long Life Care Management. Um, and I've spent my in career really supporting caregivers as well as my patients. So for an overview, we'll look at caregiving, what exactly that means and who's doing this type of um, caring. And then hopefully we'll be able to provide a few tools um, for your um, advocacy and some options for navigating care. Caregivers are heroes. We're hearing that a lot lately when we talk about our healthcare workers um, being heroes, and indeed they are our first responders, our grocery store. Really, so many of our folks in the communities are in heroes. Um, but unsung heroes, even before the COVID-19, are our family caregivers. Um, these um, caregivers play a central role in healthcare services. In fact, I was reminded um, doing in preparation for this um, presentation that that is really one of the reasons that I became a nurse. One of the reasons that I decided to um, continue on in my studies and to have a practice of my own. Um, 
patient care was certainly the centerpiece, but what really connected a dot for me is the satisfaction I got from talking to caregivers when those families came in and seeing the difference that I can make. That was really the reward for me. And so some programs, um, the VA in particular I can think of, really relies on having a family caregiver in order to um, implement services. So indeed, when I say family caregivers are a central road in healthcare, in some services, it's essential, it's required. Um, they also provide and manage direct care and maybe indirect care. Um, caregivers may um, be a support to um, a paid caregiver. Um, maybe that's financial support or emotional support. Um, they also are someone that um, are usually taking care of not just the aged, but it may be a frail patient. It may be a mental illness. Um, whatever illness, a severe or long-term chronic or because of trauma. Um, caregivers also may take care of patients with age range from infancy to 80 or 90 years old. So um, it's certainly not limited to geriatric care. Caregivers could be a relative, could be a partner, friend, um, neighbors. Um, it, caregivers really can be anyone that loves the individual that needs to be cared for. Um, it can be paid, maybe not paid. 60% um, of women are caregivers in the United States, 40% are men. Um, about half of our population, I don't know if you are surprised by that, half of our population that are employed um, are Caregivers is a very ambiguous role, but certainly they do kind of an, as we said, an unsung job in being able to take care of patients while having full time employment outside of the home in some cases. But nearly 44 million of Americans are caregivers. And when we think about that, um, particularly right now with COVID-19, I would say that number certainly has risen um, for being sheltered in place, for those that had to kind of pick up the, the role as caregivers. Perhaps they had someone else that was able to manage at one point, but because of the COVID and our limit um, socialization, they've had to take on the role of caregiver. So think about this. If you are providing care for someone um, with a chronic or serious illness, you are indeed a caregiver. And when I think about healthcare and we think about chronic care um, and Medicare population, that's a lot of folks. That's the majority of the patients that I know I see in my patients. And that's the majority of patients that interact with healthcare. And so it is certainly normal to have questions, to have uncertainties and worries um, when you go to see your doctor or when you have the opportunity to encounter a healthcare decision. Um, and that may be based on a recent diagnosis, it may be a long-term diagnosis that you're supporting your loved one with. Um, and it's okay to ask for help and some additional information to understand exactly what's going on. Patients change, their disease change, and the trajectory of their disease can change. So those questions could be ongoing. Um, at times, there may be some challenging issues you'll have to make, some decisions about advanced care planning, some decisions about new medications or maybe treatments that you're now struggling with. Um, and so this job of caregiving giving is definitely a challenge and not an easy one. COVID-19, certainly right now, this is a very difficult time for many. Um, and not just with our hair care, healthcare population. Um, I um, think often of those 90,000 some patients and 90,000 um, American lives that have been lost and the families they've left behind. Um, during a crisis, moral distress is something that we um, know is very common. We don't often want to talk about it. Nurses kind of throw this term out quite a bit in our studies and in our uh, navigation to take care of patients. But like these times or no other times, moral distress is definitely an issue. And that is the emotional state that arises from a situation when a person feels that there's an ethical correction that's happening that's different from the one that they, they want to act on sometimes policies and procedures. Um, for example, you may have a loved one that's in a long-term care facility and they're sheltered in place. And you really struggle with the fact that it's a Sunday morning and you want to have a morning prayer or morning service with them. And that's something that you're not willing to forfeit. That is a moral dilemma 
that you to make that adjustment based on a policy and procedure, and you may not agree with it. And certainly our country has seen this dilemma um, with the reopening. And caregivers should recognize that these situations do and will arise. Um, I have been in many ethics committee meetings, um, sitting down to talk to patients and their loved ones when there has been an ethic challenge. Um, the, the policy and procedure perhaps of a institution, a long-term care facility or a hospital, making a decision that the patient and perhaps the family member is not comfortable with. And so be aware of that moral distress issue and be willing to talk that through to express how you feel because your values matter and really you're the, the, um, the lead in navigating the care for your patients. So caregiver during um, the COVID-19, part of that moral distress and a solution to that, I think, is telemedicine. <laughs> You know, if, if we're going to take care of patients, but we are going to um, do the right thing is based on the CDC guideline, we need to implement some other avenues. And certainly an evidence-based model has always been telemedicine. And we're able to really optimize that at this time. Now these account encounters are available now. If you haven't had a chance to participate on your own or with a family member, do know that they are available in most healthcare settings, both clinics, um, physical therapists. We're all taking advantage of um, distancing and being able to care for our patients remotely, in most cases. Um, certainly if there's some acute event, that would not apply. Um, but do be aware when you are taking advantage of that telehealth or telemedicine encounter to limit the crowds. <laughs> that, that seems easy. You would think, well, you're having a telehealth medicine um, appointment. Why would there be a crowd? But I have noticed that even with the telemedicine, um, there may be, well, I want to be there for mom's appointment or dad wants, to, uh, dad wants to have his neighbor come here. And that may be um, beneficial to support the patient's long-term uh, long-term care, but you still want to be aware that you do not want to have a crowd even doing those encounters. Distancing remains important, and I have seen that happen because of our worry and concern of uh, discussions that may happen during a health care um, encounter or visit. Consider postponing, as we all hear, and canceling those elective encounters, but most importantly, assist with um, the, the telehealth medicine can assist with monitoring. It doesn't have to be um, a direct encounter um, or a synchronized encounter. It can be as simple as having someone monitor pulse ox for your loved one who has some breathing issue and you want to check his oxygen saturations, but you want to make sure that the home health nurse knows about it. Um, do be aware that home health agencies are also using telehealth devices so that while they may not directly be on the other side of a screen, they are able to make some um, assessments and some reviews of patients by monitoring them, their vital signs and maybe even their oxygen level. So what happens during these telehealth encounters? Well, we have a guideline. The CMS has been very thorough with all providers about the guidelines, about um, the codes that's being used, about their expectations, and they've made several waivers for us to take care of patients. But I think our patients and their families should also have some, some guidelines, at least have know what to expect and how to prepare and optimize on a telehealth visit. One, try to have some high quality equipment if possible. Um, if you have an iPhone and your family member does not, and that phone does not have a camera that really would support a clear visual for um, the provider on the other side of the screen, utilize the best equipment that's in the home. Also, if there's an issue with the volume controls, try and test that out beforehand and see if you need to use some other device or speaker or prepare the provider that you may use another medium, perhaps another phone to be able to communicate while you have a great visual. Dress the part. Certainly, if you have a loved one that's expecting an appointment, um, if they're bed bound, they may still be on their, in their night clothes, but you want to be able to have them in some clothes that are accessible particularly if the um, provider on the other side will be looking at skin. 
I know for my practice, we um, definitely have utilized telehealth to look at wounds. And certainly you wanna be able to have the patient prepared so that that wound can be viewed and so that they are actually positioned for that appointment. So be aware of that. Be punctual. Telehealth appointments are scheduled and we also know that these are, um, you know, they're appointments like any other, but be prepared to not only show up and be in front of the screen and have your loved one there, um, if that's the case, but you also want to be prepared to be to engage. And part of that is set the tone. If privacy is needed, there are other members in the family that, that are in the home at the time or in the room. Um, you may want to make that area isolated and a little bit more private. There may be some questions posed. Um, remember the provider on the other side of the screen cannot see the house in total, um, may not be able to see who's in ear a shot. And so there may be an a opportunity for some very tender are um, confidential things to be discussed. And so you wanna make sure that there's a space for that. And particularly if the patient has to unrobe. Um, prepare a list to review. Um, you may have some complaints or concerns. Now this is something that we've said even with the regular doctor's appointment, but this is definitely holds true with the telehealth encounter. Um, usually the time is pretty brief. Um, it's kind of, um, I say not complicated, but uncoordinated, <laughs> even from the provider's point of view, moving the screen and having conversation um, through a screen, you may forget a few concerns that you have that you would probably think of if you have a rapport already with your provider. Um, and do remember a few little keys that may help you with the communication during your encounter. Tell, ask, and tell. From the provider standpoint, we often tell ourselves, and talking to my patient, ask, tell, and ask. And so we've turned that around. I've turned that around here. Be prepared to say, listen, these are the things I'm concerned about today. I really want to address them during this meeting. And then hear what's being said to you. There's gonna be some questions, some follow-up, and then tell again. Now, are you telling me that I should do this or X, Y, Z? Am I hearing you say that we now need to proceed in this manner or take this particular medication or these are our options? That it certainly would kind of guide you in communicating effectively. And do that as many times as you need to based on your complaint or your concern. And then finally at the end, if you need to review and understand your appointments, have an opportunity to just kind of review. Even if you did the tell, ask, tell, maybe you wanna to look to your loved one or your loved one and say, you know, did you hear what the doctor said? Now remember, this is what he told us today. Um, and that's an opportunity for the provider to hear what the patient's saying, and hearing you tell them, and also for the provider to understand that you understand exactly what happened during the encounter. I think it's an excellent opportunity for you to get all that you need before you leave. Many times I've heard um, patients and caregivers, in fact, they've actually helped ask me to help them um, understand and navigate after the appointment. I've seen that in the hospitals. Um, doctors will walk out of the appointment and I'll come in or the nurse will come in and then there's some other questions still that they have not had answered. So do remember during this time of mental health challenges, particularly right now, we're seeing an increase uh, mental health care needs that you are not alone. The Family Care Alliance, and by the way, that's where I got those stats from regarding our caregivers, they are available. The Aging Life Care Association is available for some additional support nationwide. Aging and disability resources available. And if your loved one is a veteran, you can also tap into the VA care support line. Um, they provide some virtual um, care monthly groups that are already in session before COVID-19. Um, and those groups are ongoing. And that's the website as well, the 1-800 number as well as a website. Palliative care, many times these loved ones are not only receiving treatment, but they're struggling with symptoms and they need more of a holistic care, looking at maybe their spiritual concerns, their social concerns, their financial issues. And so palliative care can be supportive. And certainly Alzheimer's Association for some of our patients that are struggling with that disease in particular. 
So let me give you a few tools. Um, and so during this part, I'll just kind of just kind of graze over some details because as you know, our healthcare system can be quite complicated and complex. But these are some tools to be aware of and then you can dig further um, at your um, leisure or I'm definitely available to assist you in navigating. Who decides what and how? That's a question. <laughs> That's a question that we often um, have with our family members when we're taking care of our loved one. And that's a question that providers typically pose when you're entering the healthcare system or if you actually have a clinic appointment and we're trying to make a decision for treatment or who's going to sign for surgery or diagnostic or if we're taking next steps on a very serious decision. So you, at this time, a person needs to decide who will make healthcare decisions. That needs to be decided and that, that decided as a family or just an, the individual. The patient can make that determination or a family can make that determination, but there definitely needs to be a point of contact, power of authority, a next to can. There needs to be that person, not only formally or within the family, but also in documentation if necessary. If your patient is not able to speak for themselves, then you need to have the proper document so that you can speak for your loved one. And then the medical treatment, I want or don't want. This is a discussion that should be had with your loved one. Um, mom, dad, brother, sister, um, what, what, what are your values? What's important to you? Do you want to have IV treatment? Do you want to have blood transfusion? Would you want additional surgery now? Um, and so these conversations may vary. There's not one set answer that these conversations will vary and can be um, quite tender and it may take some time to sort through that. But certainly as an advocate for your loved one and that caregiver uh, should be able to speak then for what the patient would want as far as medical treatment. And what matters most? What matters most? Be clear um, with um, not only yourself, because sometimes what matters most to you may not matter most to your loved one. And so when you're speaking and caring for a loved one, you absolutely want to represent them. And I tell my patients all the time when they come in and they say, well, you know, mom told me, dad told me, this is what they prove. You don't have to wonder, you don't have to guess you are absolutely honoring your loved one's wishes because they've already made it clear to you. You've already had the discussion or he or she has already given you that information. So decide that, what matters most or have that discussion for sure. And how I want people to treat me. That seems like a no brainer. Dignity, honor. I always want my hat on. <laughs> I want my glasses. I wanna be called a Dr. English. You know, I've had patients that have prestige careers and certainly at this the point in their life when they're no longer to communicate, they were still Mr. Jones, still Reverend Henry, still Dr. Smith. We still utilize their um, credentials, their title, their, their honor um, in taking care of them. And that was important. And I have had caregivers to make sure that that was still part of their identity. So how I want people to treat me, um, that's certainly important. Um, and whatever that looks like, it doesn't have to be a title, of course. There can be a number of um, concerns, a number of desires. We just want to make sure they're implemented. And then lastly, what I want my loved one to know about me. You know, there may be um, an opportunity to talk a little bit further, more intimately about, you know, I just want you to know that no matter what, happens with my care that I think you did a great job. I just want you to know that I'm totally comfortable if you defer my care to brother, my brother. I just want you to know that as long as I'm comfortable, I am fine staying here in your home. I want you to know that it's okay if it needs to be at some point in time, caregiver burden is too much, that I'm okay going to um, a long-term care facility. And so talking about what matters most, what your loved one um, needs to know, 
having that conversation. And that is, that's an exchange. So it's not necessarily just coming from the patient or just from my perspective, the patient or a loved one, but also the caregiver. I think that would really um, be um, tools to walk away with in deciding care before you get to some of the details that you have to make at the healthcare setting. Now, the five wishes um, is uh, advanced care directive. It's an easy legal guide that can help you sort through those um, topics of who decides what and how. Um, it allows an opportunity to visit any faith concerns, um, any spiritual traditions, um, that dignity of care that I referred to, also traditions um, about your healthcare decision making and preferences can all be outlined. Um, it also allows you to outline any important medical decisions um, in, in the event that there is a serious illness, whether or not the, the, your loved one wants to have um, CPR co completed or it wants to be a do not resuscitate or do not want to receive um, additional treatments or surgeries or uh, allows you to allow, line out medical decisions as well. And it doesn't have to be in a very... Um, um, you know, legal or medical terms. Um, it just simply allows you to kind of sketch out what your thoughts are and, and very easy to do. Also, an opportunity to express wishes to empower the family and the friend and the doctors to make decisions. Because remember, this tool really allows the patient to speak when they cannot speak or to have a representative to speak for them. Um, that it's a living will. Um, it's advanced care planning. And so a very great tool. I would encourage you to um, go online. It's available free online and you can get several copies. Um, if you have not seen a copy of Five Wishes, um, you can utilize one, not just for your loved one, but also for yourself. So let's talk about navigating healthcare options. There are many, of course, um, we know in our um, healthcare system, insurance is the backbone Long-term care policies is often um, something we, we can consider. Private pay is certainly um, an option for some. Medicare is utilized quite a bit and Medicaid for those that certainly are in need. So with our insurance, we have a number of providers, the private providers, Blue Cross, United Healthcare, um, HMOs like Kaiser, typically insure those um, under a 65 years of age. Um, and there can be more than one policy. One policy is a primary and then that secondary policy. Long-term care insurance has definitely um, been very popular in the last few years um, as far as the, the um, advertisement for it or hearing a lot more. I don't see it being utilized as much um, for my patients um, and in the community because it can be very pricey. But the product does help recover some costs with long-term care, um, particularly if it's bought early, um, early in life. And so it can cover some general um, costs that may not be covered under Medicare and Medicaid when you're going through such a um, tough coverage of long-term care uh, facility costs and management. Private pay, uh, certainly patient will pay out of pocket for that, and that may be for services um, not covered under insurance, such as um, getting someone to maybe help with bathing um, when it hasn't been ordered by a doctor through home health. That can be a nice resource. Um, while it is private pay, it's an ability to pay now rather than pay later. That's what I like to say. Um, if it, there's an opportunity and the funds available, private pay allows the caregiver to not only have their loved one stay home longer perhaps, but also allows the caregiver to earn money um, while their loved one is being taken care of. And then Medicare um, certainly was number one as far as being used generally in the population of the age of the, those 65 and older, and it pays for nursing home, skilled care, so that's a nursing home receiving RN and medication services. Um, it also will pay for um, home health. Um, it covers hospice care at 100%. It also will cover your primary care visits. 
and it can be um, added to an advantage plan can be added to that as well. Okay. Now, Medicare does not cover long term care. Um, so while it will cover your long term care in a nursing home, it will not cover some of those incidentals that may be needed um, outside of that nursing home. Okay, the room and board and some of the other details there. And that's when the long term care policy can really help. Um, this is again is an overview. So if you need to talk with an insurance agent to be get some more details on long term care insurance, I advise that. And also the um, Medicare.gov can be helpful if you have additional questions about your Medicare. Usually, though, if you're talking to um, the nursing home or your doctor's office, they can be a great resource. Medicaid is also, please do not forget that for um, patients that have an income that will target um, them being in that criteria for Medicaid, please take advantage of that um, because it can have dual coverage. Both the Medicare and Medicaid together can cover some costs that certainly for patients that do not have the income that can be very helpful. Healthcare issues and options with the, that insurance kind of overview, be aware that you can come to the table with your insurance, your Medicare, um, your Medicaid, um, your private insurance or your private funds and long term care coverage in some cases, depending on the policy to help you with some living expenses. Now, independent living would not cover because this would be a private home. Um, this may be a 55 and, and over um, private home and suite or, or a condo. Um, and so this is the ability to kind of go and come as, as you will, um, independent living. Now, there are some assisted living facilities um, that will allow that same um, setup. Um, and which it gives a lot of socialization and they usually have um, a skilled um, individual or staff member on board to assist patients that are having some medical issues. However, they do not provide skilled care um, routinely. Now, assisted living facility, which I just brought up, um, will help with housing those that are elderly or disabled. Um, they also provide some nursing care. Um, again, this is not for routine. That would be more of a long-term care facility, and we'll talk about that more. But they do provide some great group activities, help preparation of meals and medications, and provide some modest assistance with um, ADLs or daily living assistance. Um, they usually have a certified nursing assistant assistant or medical assistance that can help a patient that's fairly independent but does need some assistance with care. In some of these facilities, assisted living facility or a nursing home, you may find a memory care and this is a suite or unit that um, specializes in taking care of those patients with cognitive issues such as Alzheimer's or dementia. And so for those patients, they really cater their services, providing some social outlet, providing safety, um, providing some additional assistance with um, ADLs, their uh, daily living assistance, bathing, and, and also feeding, keeping an eye on some um, of those patients for some of their high risk. It's a wonderful resource. I've always enjoyed when I went to my long-term care facility spending time over there. In fact, if you, you needed to find me in the building, even when I was not caring for a patient, I was usually in the memory care center. It was just such a, such a warm feeling there um, as the patients and the staff were so loving. The whole facility at large, but, but being so cozy, I thought the memory center was just, just really, um, just touched my heart. And then home health. Home health is being utilized quite a bit. I had a patient um, just uh, two weeks ago and she went to the hospital and I just did a follow up with her caregiver, which was the daughter-in-law. And I called her back after just checking in with how her mom was doing there. And I said, don't forget at discharge planning to have a conversation with the nurse or the social worker. They kind of exchange those roles sometime when discharge planning is going on about home health. And she quickly said to me, she said, well, you know, mom's, um, mom's blood sugar was fine. It, she got there and she was fine. I was so pleased. And, and they said her blood pressure was also stable. And there were two things that she was concerned about prior to her mom going in. Um, and, and I said, but you, I said to her, I said, why was that? Why was it fine? Why were those levels so great? And she just kind of paused and I said, you did a great job. 
You've been doing a great job. Her insulin regimen, her, her dietary measures, checking her blood pressure, giving her her blood pressure medicine. In fact, that's one of the reasons we met is that she needed a refill and was really having um, um, a difficulty getting in touch with the primary care provider and getting that refill squared away. And we managed to do that. Um, but because of her efforts, those two issues were not an issue. So that was great. And so I reminded her because of that, home health may be an option still because it will support that transition back from the hospital to home and allow her to continue the great care that she certainly has been doing all along. And so the reason for that is that at this charge, if there's a clinical reason to have home health, the physician, the discharge a planner or a provider can go ahead and write that order because home health has to be a skilled care. It's not something that can just be ordered arbitrarily when you're already home and you're just thinking about physical therapy or speech without seeing a provider. And certainly at discharge planning, that's the opportunity to talk about it. Doesn't mean every discharge from the hospital needs home health, but it's certainly an opportunity if that's um, a need that you have. And so be aware of that. They also, along with the home health, may provide some non-skilled care as well. Um, have a, a nursing assistant come in with some bathing and eating um, or helping the patient eat um, and get back um, to their baseline. Don't forget about in-home care services. It can be pricey. This can be one of those private pay needs, but it may be a nice support to a caregiver that doesn't have any additional um, help um, with care. And it also may help with safety, um, making sure your loved one um, who may be risk, at risk for a fall can avoid that. Um, it also may be an opportunity to have some socialization, um, not only provide the care and the bathing, um, it may also be an opportunity to have another face to interact with and another loving hand. Um, and, and, also, and one thing that I have found with some of my um, patients, um, particularly some of my male caregivers caring for a, a mom or a female, that it allows some dignity there to have a caregiver come in and provide some of the ADLs. And they may do that just for a few hours uh, a week. Do note that as I refer to home health, that rehab rehabilitation um, is a skilled care. And so if you have some concerns, maybe it's not about falls, but maybe it's about um, potential risks in the home. Maybe it's about being able to navigate the kitchen um, that occupational therapist or a physical therapist may be utilized and that would be through a home health. That can be at home or it can be inpatient depending on the patient's needs. And I referred to earlier the nursing home and Medicare coverage, your long-term care policy. Um, nursing homes are a wonderful resource. Um, there are some very loving, caring, dedicated staff members that are doing their best, best and are embedded. I know I, I was embedded in the nursing home to make sure that those patients um, have a quality life. Um, I was reminded that we are living in their place of residence. We are working in their place of residence, um, not vice versa. They're not, they're not visiting us. We're visiting them to make sure that they have great care and um, quality of life. They can provide, as I said, some of the physical therapy, some of the skilled care, and the socialization. Um, and if you do have a loved one in the nursing home, be active about what you want to see in the nursing home. There generally are caregiver committees going on. There certainly has to be a patient committee. I watched that at the VA in particular, where the veterans at their community living center were able to have um, a quarterly meeting where they discuss their needs and concerns. Um, and sometimes those meetings were pleasant and sometimes they weren't, but they were able to voice exactly what they wanted to see for their living. And that should be no different for a loved one that's living in a nursing home. So I would encourage you to be active and keep in contact with your nurse, attend your care plan meetings, ask questions, and utilize the encounter telehealth encounter tips that we discussed earlier. 
palliative care is also a resource. I think I touched on that when I mentioned the, the number of um, websites and the number of agencies available. Um, palliative care is an interdisciplinary team that's looking at patients with very serious illnesses, usually complex illnesses. You may hear about this with patients with a end-stage cancer or maybe for patients with um, a chronic illness that they don't expect a cure for, but they certainly are still seeking treatment and doing very well, but they have some symptoms as a result of their treatment. Um, palliative care, you may find it inpatient. When a patient goes to the hospital, you may see a provider come to make sure they've had a bowel movement, make sure they're, they're not feeling anxious, make sure that their pain or their shortness of breath are controlled. And you may also have an opportunity to see a provider in a clinic. Lastly, you may have a provider for palliative care come to your home. And so it just depends on the patients and what their needs are. But this is a specialty of care that's available and it's growing more and more. Lastly, under that umbrella of palliative care, a more specialized palliative care is hospice. The same interdisciplinary team approach their goal is for those terminally ill patients that have decided they, they just want comfort measures and that they want to be supported and receive um, care in their home. And so they receive that care by not only a nurse, but they have a physician involved, or they have a social worker, a chaplain, a volunteer available. And the volunteer is available not just for the patient, but for the caregiver. Hospice agency really prides itself on taking care of the patient and caregiver. And I really do not see enough caregivers taking advantage of the services available for patients that um, have chosen to have hospice care. The social workers can be a great resource, not for bereavement, but for care in the middle of, um, of the crisis or in the middle of your concerns about a loved one um, on hospice care. So do be aware of that. Lastly, geriatric care managers. This is a fairly new um, uh, role, I would say, and it operates similar to the palliative and hospice, but it allows you to have somewhat of a concierge care. Um, this provider will be able to assist you care for your loved one. Um, and so the, the provider for geriatric care looks very similar to hospice and palliative. They may have dual roles like a discharge planner, a nurse, or a social worker, and their objective is to be able to bring services to the patient and to cut out the middleman, if you will, to be able to um, interpret care for the patient and bring services to them as quickly as possible and on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Manage medications, um, sit with them with specialty care, discuss next steps, and really kind of look ahead um, and to navigate care. And that concludes my review. I hope this has been helpful and I'm certainly available for any questions. A lot of information and topics, but most importantly, letting you know that um, we care about caregivers and there are a number of resources to help you thrive while you're caring for your loved ones. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. English. Uh, that was great. You really went over, uh, went over that well. Um, we do have some, an opportunity here, a few minutes for some questions. If anybody has any, you can use the chat feature or the Q and A. Um, and I'm going to start it off. I actually had a couple, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm, you know, my father's, uh, elderly and, uh, going through some health issues right now with some cancer treatments and, um, the, um, the teledoc, um, I know that's something that, that could be beneficial to him, but he's not, well, he thinks he's not uh, tech savvy. He does have a smartphone and he operates it pretty well, but I know he wouldn't be comfortable doing that. Um, so I guess it's that's something that we would have to go set up for him and, and kind of be there to, to take care of that, just like a, a doctor's visit, I guess. But um, uh, any advice as far as someone that's not comfortable doing the technology kind of thing? Um, sure, sure. That's a, that option. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, many of the clinics have a number of software. So when you're saying not comfortable, um, similar to Zoom or DoxyMe, um, so while your father may not be able to get that set up, um, a loved one can be there to do that for him um, to go ahead and get, you know, get the link up and open the line up so that he can have that one on one and then close that out afterwards. Um, and so I think that would be a nice option. Mm -hmm. Um, the second part is that because of the Medicare waiver, some visits can be completed just by telephone without the visual. Um, okay. And so I, I would check with your provider about that, um, the dilemma you have with the, the tech and if that's a visit that they can indeed complete um, just by the telephone without the actual app. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, another thing with kind of what's the best way to go about this, right? You know, like in my situation right now, my dad's very independent. He still drives, he still can get around uh, and do things. Um, but I know it's gonna come to a point where maybe that's not the case, where maybe he shouldn't be driving or how do you navigate that if maybe he thinks he should, but you think he shouldn't mm -hmm. as far as uh, family goes, as far as when that independence um, you know, how do you intervene into mm -hmm. that if you think it's not safe for them? Right. That's a very good question. I think being able to keep the dialogue open, as we talked about, of who decides what, when, and how. Um, being able to talk about, Dad, what's, what's important to you? I know I'm concerned about your driving, um, and I, I just know how, or I hear you say, that it's so important for you to remain independent. Um, because I'm concerned, would it be beneficial for maybe for me to take you on a few of your um, trips out? Um, and I won't interfere, um, but um, you know, we're just going to drop you off just because I'm concerned. But I know that you know you want to you know go on your appointments, and I and I want to be a part of that. I want to help you. And so I think keeping the lines of communication and express not only what matters to you, what's important to him, um, but being able to share that um, is really the key. And, and beyond anything else, and I think you mentioned it already about the independence, reserving dignity, allowing your loved one, particularly an aged uh, loved one to um, elder loved one to be able to say what they desire most. Uh, what's important to them, and then trying to navigate around that as best as possible and coming to a meeting ground. Okay. And if necessary, you can always utilize a social worker to kind of help um, help facilitate that conversation. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, I think that's um, oh, one thing I was going to mention, and, and I've kind of used this, uh, and maybe it'll be a help also when you're talking about questions at the doctor's office. Me and my sister kind of have alternated taking my dad to his appointments uh, for his cancer doctor. And a lot of times there's a lot of information uh, during that thing. And we started recording it. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if she's not there, I just use my phone to, you know, a voice messaging thing to record. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that way if she's not there, I can send her the recording so she knows what's going on. Uh, and also it can remind us what the doctor said because uh, you know, I'm, my memory is not as great as it used to be either. So sometimes <laughs> yes. I don't remember yes. uh, everything that went on. So just, uh, just yes. kind of something we've done there. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so that's all I have. I don't see any, uh, any other questions right now. Okay. Um, which that means you did a good job. <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> I have a lot of questions hopefully. and you went over everything very well. Yes, uh, yes. So um, I do appreciate that. So we will have this recording available on our resource page. Mm -hmm. And I did have that in the chat together for henry.com. Mm -hmm. I see one of our uh, home help uh, right at home has posted in the chat, Jack, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you're the best agency ever. <laughs> I appreciate that, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have quite a few um, other uh, companies that they cover pretty much everything you talked about uh, mm -hmm. in our in our directory. So if anybody's looking for anything from hospice to home health care, nursing homes, uh, anything like that, of course, Dr. English uh, mm -hmm. will be a great resource. 
Um, but then also we have others that are, are in our directory as well. So if you're looking for somebody like that, let me know. I'll be glad to give you the options that we have uh, that are members. Uh, and again, also, I do have this presentation you sent me earlier, Dr. English. Uh, okay. Would it be okay if I post that on our resource Absolutely. page as well with Absolutely. the video? Okay, so we'll do that. So we'll have uh, the presentation up as well. And it'll be up in the next couple of days. Um, we also have some other webinars scheduled uh, we're working on. We don't have the exact topics down yet, but we'll have those coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so just make sure and check back with us and, uh, and you'll get information about those as well. Uh, so any parting words, Dr. English, from you? Just take care of the caregiver. Let's be All sensitive right. to those caregivers. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you again for your time and thank everyone for joining us. And we will see you next time. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.